Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Polkadot. Polkadot is the largest community DAO empowering 1.3 million DOT holders to shape the future of the network through active participation. With over 500 applications backed by over $6 billion in shared security, Polkadot's adaptable technology powers a diverse ecosystem from DeFi to AI. Join the Polkadot DAO and be part of that transformation. This episode is sponsored by Mantra. The Mantra chain is the purpose-built layer one blockchain designed for tokenized real-world assets and regulated digital assets, offering scalable, high-performance architecture. Positioned as the blockchain for tokenized RWAs, Mantra is onboarding traditional financial institutions into Web3. Join the ongoing OM Gen Drop campaign and be part of the future of regulated digital assets today. All right, everybody, what's going on? We've got another roundup edition of On The Margin. We're recording here today right after the NFP print that came out this morning. That is just the talk of the town. What's going on, guys? Not much. Just uh, recovering from that world's most important NFP print. Until the next yeah. NFP print. Yeah, until next week when we get an unemployment claims number on Thursday. Qu Quinn's on his like third happy hour drink over there. What, what are you drinking? Is it but buttery nipples? Is that your favorite drink? I got the agua, man. I got the agua. We keep it oh, down in waters. Seen gas. Yeah. Agua seen yeah. gas. Yeah, what are really they drinking over there? Pints? Lagers? That's a very different vibe from the 8 a.m. situation I got going on here in Western Canada. But uh, that's going to lead to some good dynamics. We got the we got the European late night show and then the, the early morning Pacific show. So we got a lot of interesting data that came in from the NFP this morning. The main points to look at is the change in non-farm payrolls came in at 142,000, which was lower than the expected um, number. We saw the unemployment rate come in at 4.2%, which is a decrease from the previous month of 4.3%, which was a major upside surprise. What was really interesting to me is just comparing this this decrease in the U3 unemployment rate with this increase in the actually the, the U6 unemployment rate actually increased from 7.8 to 7.9 percent. So there's an interesting dispersion there. And I just wanted to compare as well. We got some data from Canada today, my my great nation, that is just looking way more like what a classic recession slowdown is actually looking like. So we got an upside surprise on the unemployment rate there. It came in at 6.6 percent versus the expected um, 6.5 and a downside miss on the change in unemployment too, or sorry, employment too. So it's just an interesting comparison to look at the two, but there's some really interesting things. And I think the market, you know, when this print came out first, there was not too much movement in, in futures markets or anything like that, but we've seen this acceleration over this morning. And I think that really ties into the picture that a lot of the nuance is you have to kind of dig deep to see what's going on here. So got a few charts here to, to do that digging deep and see what's going on. So the big one as well is around revisions. We've had some further revisions to the past few months on non-farm payrolls that make it even weaker than it's it's looked like. And this is off the back of that major revision that we saw um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago. So July's number of 114,000 got revised downwards to 89. And we've seen some further decreases in, in June and May as well. All of that to say is that it basically leads to, you know, in the last three months, we've down we've seen a downside revision of like 178,000 jobs. So that's, that's significant. And so just on that point, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, it, it seems so ridiculous to me that we put all this trading like trillions of dollars trade on numbers that just whimsically get revised like the birth yeah. death model and yeah. you know you have now you have like foreign immigration no one knows what the hell's going on but like we trade so much of it i guess like over a trend which is what we're trying to catch here you've mm -hmm. been nailing that felix so yeah going? sorry <laughs> it's so true though and i think my opinion on this gets lost a lot because i i don't take the revisions that seriously and people are always like oh you know the data is made up but like yeah everybody you know in this market knows it's it's not as accurate but we still it, it drives markets because everybody else knows it drives markets and it's like this reflexivity thing so everybody knows but i you know when you talk about revisions it's like okay well what's the trade you know like the, the yeah, what are you gonna? Yeah, exactly. yeah. So it's like it doesn't matter if you're actually trying to make money. If you're trying to be right on Twitter all day, maybe it matters. But if you're actually trying to make money, like you just have to take these things at face value and trade the expectations of it. So that's what we're trying to figure out here. Rant over. This chart from Parker Ross brought up an interesting point that I didn't actually know about. Well, wasn't fully aware, but it was just how they statistically model the the change in non-farm payrolls, and basically they target a ninety percent confidence interval. So. 
whenever we see the change in non-farm payables be like a hundred thousand or less, that's actually so much so outside of their confidence interval that you know by like a hundred thousand that you know if we we saw in July it got downside revised to eighty nine thousand. When you look at it from a statistical lens, there's just as much of it that the error term is just as much possible that we saw like a downside print in July. And it takes time to understand that. And that's why these revisions come in later. But the fact is that, you know, the, it, it's a wider band on the confidence interval than I think most really understand. And, and that's where these revisions come from. So obviously, we're seeing that the job gains that we thought were happening over the last six months are not as accurate as we thought. And this is due to this confidence interval and how NFP is calculated. One of the big ones when you look into this has been a key theme for a while now. It's just where are these job gains losses happening? Total full time jobs decrease of four hundred and thirty eight um, versus the increase in part time of five twenty seven. So this paints a picture of a fragmented you know labor market where you know you, you got to ask yourself: Are these people that are picking up an additional part time job because you know they're trying to make ends meet? Are they, you know, being laid off from their full-time job and then having to pick up multiple part-time jobs to make ends meet? But the fact is that, you know, it's it's a, it's a key rule that full-time job gains is a lot higher quality than part-time job gains. This is something Tyler was just mentioning, but um, again, tied into this full-time part-time discrepancy or not discrepancy, but dispersion is the change in unemployment in by origin um, between foreign-born workers and native-born workers. So we've seen. Basically, all the job gains go to uh, foreign-born workers and a lot of the decrease in employment coming from native-born workers. What do you think about that, Tyler? <laughs> I, I, this, this, is, this is a slide. I mean, this seems like you could take this out of Trump, like the Trump campaign. I mean, this is like, it, it, it's almost like weird to even think about the reason behind mm-hmm. this. Like, is it, yeah, uh, like foreign-born workers, that could be, any sort of immigration, it doesn't need to just be like the the recent surge, but yeah, I think it, regardless, it this Plato talks about this, but you, you need to have a social contract. And the more there's parts of the country that get benefited to the detriment of others, is like on a large scale, it it really tears at you know the fibers of our country. So. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it's it's great if these are legal immigrants. I love that, um, and they deserve the jobs. But a lot of this is you know, it gets you get in a political political territory. But it's pretty shocking when you see it in a yeah. It's it's really painting a picture between I think why the, these you know labor prints are so confusing is when you look at the data that we just did on the actual jobs report and the change in non farm payrolls, it keeps looking worse than it actually has been. But then when we look at unemployment rates, it keeps seeing somewhat better than what we've been seeing historically. So this is a great chart from um, Eric, who I just interviewed this week and had a really great interview with there. And he showed the previous month's version of this chart, and he just updated it this morning. So it shows the unemployment by reason. And, you know, you would expect if we're going into an imminent recession, that permanent job losers would increase significantly. But it's just chopping around flat. Um, one of the big reasons that we saw this surge to 4.3 last month was temporary layoffs. And that purple line you can see is reversed now. So that was a lot of the reason why we saw this downside move on the unemployment rate. But the fact of the matter is that we're not seeing this blue line, the permanent job losers surge. I want to be seeing that to really confirm this significant deterioration in the economy and in the labor market that is saying, you know, recession is looming, but we're not seeing that right yeah. now. The, the the slide, my first reaction to the slide before with the native form thing is that, and this could be completely wrong, but is that, you know, the majority of the, the recent huge spike in, in my immigration is, is from probably lower and middle income uh, workers. I mean, they could be very educated, but, uh, you know, whatever the types of jobs they're taking are probably the lower middle income. But to me, it it shows like generally just the two speed economy between, you know, like we've been talking about that policy has been restrictive for, for small, medium sized businesses that employ the most people in the country. And it's really the long and variable legs of, of the fed orchestrating this huge front end rate hike while the treasury managing the the long end. Well said. Um, 
I have a couple more charts here and then we can get into the actual market impact of this because there's a lot going on there as well. But I just want to compare what we're seeing in the more, you know, lagging components of what the unemployment rate is, unemployment rate is with what we're seeing in terms of the trend in um, jobless claims. This is, you know, the four week moving average is moving lower, not higher. And this is a this is a more high frequency data point. Um, so we're seeing this discrepancy that needs to be noted. Um, and this is, again, getting to this trend of what we're seeing right now is these economic you know, and business cycle shifts are really difficult in the moment because of these revisions and seasonality points and just you know noisy data points that sort of say different things. So we're seeing a different thing being said by the jobless claims from what we just saw in you know what was a pretty shitty you know NFP print, like significant downside revisions. But at the same time, we're seeing this chart where you know it's coming lower. There's there's less and less initial claims. So that's something to keep in mind of. And again, getting into this, you know. We're gonna we're gonna say that the trend of today's report is just dispersion of, of data. This is a great chart, just looking at the what I'd mentioned about how the U3 unemployment rate, which is the main one everybody looks at, that's the one that you know goes into the inputs of things like the Fed's Taylor Rule and, and other different uh, monetary policy decisions like that. But then you also have the U6, which is a more broad based metric. Um, it has things like disenfranchised um, and distressed workers that you know, or have, have kind of exited because they've given up on trying to find a job. So it's it's really interesting to see that this went up from 7.8 to 7.9 this month at the same time that the unemployment U3 went from 4.3 to 4.2. I think this is where the trend is more important than anything else. Yeah. And, you know, just from Fed expectations, what the market's actually pricing in is a higher chance of 50 basis points cut now because the trend has changed mm-hmm. and there's something clearly softening in the economy. So... To, to your point, yeah. but one-offs, the one-offs are, data is crazy, but over a rolling period, it makes a lot more sense. Agreed. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to look too deeply into this, but it is something of note to me. Um, but the, the, the trend is clear. It's, mm-hmm. it's going higher. The, the big question now is how far does that trend continue and when does it start to slow down or is it even going to accelerate in a convex nature? Because, you know, something that we talked about, and this actually goes into the SOM rule, which we've been talking about. So this, this increased to point, uh, you know, 57 basis points. Um, so we're seven basis points above now where that threshold is for being in a recession. And this is really just a data point that ties into this idea of momentum and unemployment rate and how when it starts to move, it really moves. So yeah, the trend is obvious. Now we just have to figure out where does it end and how much does it accelerate? And that's really the key to unlocking whether this is a recession or a growth scare. Almost to a T, Waller came out right after this and he said the the current batch of data requires action. If appropriate, we'll advocate for front-loading rate cuts and basically saying, you know, 50 bips is, is on the table essentially. So yeah, Goolsby just also went on and said, uh, there's overwhelming fed consensus for multiple rate cuts. And when asked about 50 basis points in September, uh, he said, what happens at next meeting alone is not what's most important, important. And when asked about doing bigger cuts, he said, look at the dot plots, which did not show inflation coming down this fast or unemployment rising this high. And, mm-hmm. and like, they just sent out the plunge protection team at uh, you know <laughs> a, fri- a Friday afternoon or Friday morning. Yeah. At, they really you know, did, and like some- look at what that's doing to the sofa curve. Like look at the pace of rate cuts here. This is yeah. insane. We're dropping off a cliff. I gotta say, you know the we've been watching break evens, and that's been telling the story perfectly. This is mm-hmm. uh, forward inflation break evens, and that's been saying you know that cuts. And, and so is what's the name? Fed guy, your, your buddy Fed guy. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is what you should be watching instead of uh, lagging, you know, inflation indicators. indicators. What, I, what my probably, where I probably stretch or have clearly stretched from the market consensus the most is that, uh, is, is I, I guess most people, I think most people believe the Fed probably has the resolve to, to cut enough. Um, I think there's some people that believe they won't be able to cut enough because inflation will, will stop them or that's probably less. I think it's probably more people think that their cuts won't be impactful. I've seen a couple of headlines. I think Lynn Alden's like July newsletter or something said in the same way rate hikes weren't, you know, rest- that restrictive at the beginning, rate cuts won't be uh, as helpful at the beginning. So I think it's more of just like this hangover feel like we were talking this, we're in this murky transition period where you said is, are things going to 
accelerate to the downside in, in a worse way before the Fed can act. But I think it was such a drastic shift in their policy. Mm-hmm. They're say- The quiet part that they're not saying is that they ma- made a mistake in, in June. Remember when yes. we were discussing yeah, We were yelling June. about that in June. Yes. I was like, we I were, hope this was intentional they delivered- to buy optionality because otherwise it's a hard landing. The CPI came in easy. They were set up prime. The market was looking like it was going to break out that day and boom, smacked. And that was the big, like, but the Fed doesn't really publicly discuss mistake. They don't call things policy mistakes really until like 10 years later. So yeah, <laughs> they're, they're all aware of it. And to me, that's what this action is saying. And I'm of the view for multiple reasons that it's going to work. Yeah. I think the hard part, and we were talking about this off camera before we started, and I think it actually ties in well to your the, your fancy word art that I keep roasting you about, but it's actually like such a great way to think about this is we're living in, in this convex moment where, you know, as you know, like we've been talking about unemployment rate tends to trend when it goes and it tends to accelerate. So it's convex in nature. And from what happened during the Jackson hole meeting, chair Powell has basically attached the fed reaction function to the unemployment rate. So if it accelerates in a convex nature, monetary easing is going to accelerate in a convex nature. And so that's what we're trying to figure out now. And now the hard part is, and this is what always happens in these shifts, is like the reason markets puke during these, you know, growth scares, recessions, market, you know, crashes type things is because the Fed is slightly behind the curve. And, you know, the reason everybody talks about how the first rate cut is often bearish is because you often need to hit this equilibrium state where the Fed catches up enough to basically see it start to increase higher. And then that's when the easing comes in. You know, if if you're trading March 2020, you'll have experienced this because, you know, the Fed brought rates down to zero. They basically announced QE infinity and the markets kept tanking. And it wasn't until they really got underneath it. And then we soared for two years straight. So you just have to manage your risk through these moments. But it's it's clear where we're going you know like we have nobody's talking about inflation anymore it's just about how much you know how how big is the bazooka that's coming so the direction is clear you just have to manage your risk till we get to that point and that's always the hard part yeah that's that's my argument in having a more positive tilt than i've had in a long time is just you know when you're on that curve you know march was at the bottom where we had a lot more pain to go before we were going to get any monetary reaction and we again june back to that we had uh, the first global central bank cuts. We it was in Switzerland, Canada, and Europe, uh, ECB, I think. So that was kind of like there was there's many good reasons to believe they actually wanted to go that meeting, and now they're paying for it, and the market doesn't love it. But yeah, anyways, we can we can get more into that later. I think the the yield curve inverting. That's, that's the another point actually is mm-hmm. seeing a lot of talk around the yield curve inverting being necessarily bad for risk and are you saying um, it re, like re steepening above like going positive again yeah yeah yes steepening yeah. sorry Un- steepening uninverting uninverting yeah yeah but to me i actually think tactically it's a it's not a great position if you, you're hearing everybody talk about the steepener trade now which means by a local top because yeah. you so showed that sofa curve the front end is so low you know we're talking hundreds of base points of cuts and for it to steepen here, it'd be more without the back end, you know, repricing higher for growth. So mm-hmm. I think we actually calm, calm here a little bit. Yeah. Tyler, how are you looking? Cause you've been talking a lot about the, the yield curve inversions that we've been seeing. And it's interesting to see like, yeah, the, the tens twos is positive now, but the, the 10 year, three months is still quite negative. Um, it's always good to look at both of them in tandem here. You can see, you know, often 10 twos will move first and then 10 three month will move after because the three month is closer to the actual Fed funds rate. Um, so you have to be a lot more imminent to the Fed cuts. Um, but typically these will both go significantly positive if we're seeing that recession rotation happening. So Tyler, how are you thinking about this? You know, I just wanted to show two charts. Which is slide 25 is the one year break evens that, you know, we touched on earlier. So this is forward inflation uh, one year out. And when you go below zero, that's signaling the market is in deflationary territories. I think what happened was, you know, the Fed raised rates, it cut off dollar liquidity to basically all the emerging markets. And now, you know, we've broken China in a lot of senses, China real estate market imploding. Um, the, The interesting thing is like, if you look at Chinese banks, they're actually 
rising here. So that's there's, there's a lot of different like uh, divergences happening. But the point is that at least from commodity inflation and you know what what these break evens look at, inflation is breaking lower. And if you look at uh, slide 26, this is we talk about this a lot. This is the nominal yield on two years versus uh, forward inflation two years out. And when the ratio of these two things is high, that means real rates are high, and which also means the economy is pretty restrictive in terms of, or the Fed is restrictive in terms of um, where they are in in their policy. So um, th this should come down. And hopefully it comes down fast enough where we don't get into a recession, but they really need to front, I think, front load the, the easing here. And I, I bet they do 50 basis points next meeting. And that's, that's they, they need to, otherwise the credit markets will probably unravel. You know, the, the, the third thing I'm kind of looking at, which is kind of interesting, uh, and we, we talk about this pretty consistently because it's important, but slide 31 is the uh, high yield credit spreads. And even today with the market imploding, you can see you know, the triple C spreads, which is you know junk, really junky junk, they're not blowing out by any means. So even in this equity market valuation check, which is what I think this is, is a rotation into bonds from equities. And that, that, that's the massive macro thing that's going on here is inflation is dropping and owning bonds is more uh, in, inflation and growth are dropping and owning bonds is the best play relative to equities because equities were overvalued. Now we'll, we'll see, like you said, if it becomes recessionary or not, but right now I think credit spreads are telling you this is just a valuation check in equity rather than anything else. Because yeah. if it, something worse, you would see, people getting out of high yield and they're, they're not doing that yet. In fact, you know, you could say the global liquidity cycle is still going. I, I think it is personally. I think this is going to be a rotation into different sectors of the market. I wouldn't touch large cap with a 10 foot pole here uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons, but I think the generative AI stuff was a bubble and I could go on pontificate philosophically why, but there's one thing that just hit this morning I wanted to, to highlight, and it was a Bloomberg article that said, funds with 350 billion are exposed to S&P's new index cap rules. Index tracking funds with 350 billion in assets are due for a big revamp later this month. With equity market getting increasingly top heavy in the era of big tech, S&P will now reduce the weightings of the market leaders in proportion to their capitalization. In the event, they get even bigger and breach size-related thresholds and key industry benchmarks. Uh, it's a material departure from the current approach where the smallest of the group gets their weighting trimmed at first when preset thresholds get, are triggered. So basically, you know, you you can't have an increasing amount of dollars go to the increasingly biggest stocks. They're capping that, so you can't go to the fangs anymore. Wow. And these market structure things are. They're nutty. This could honestly be why the, the equity market's freaking out today is because uh, of stuff like that more so than anything else. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm not seeing anybody talk about that, but that feels like it has significant implications. Yes, huge, huge implications. Like these, yeah. these things are, are when, you're, when the market is passively managed, and Felix, you, you put in a chart of the microstructure of the market being passively managed. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about this earlier in the week. These decisions way, way bigger than they ever they ever used to. So that could potentially be why the queues are getting absolutely hammered. And relatively, check this out: XLP, which is a consumer staples ETF, is barely down. There's certain parts <laughs> of, of the market, like it's at all time highs. Yeah. Oh, so, utilities, staples, yeah. Uh, yeah. XLRE, the you know KRE, the banks. Yeah, yeah. you're right, Tyler. The I should put put this in the slideshow, but there's a headline this week. Uh, Tuesday, the return first trading day after Labor Day was the largest corporate bond issuance day on record. So that's yeah. not really something that occurs when uh, you have everybody really freaked on. on yeah, the you know. the opposite happens. Issuance freezes yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, they, they lock up. And and it was probably fully subscribed. Like you didn't yeah, see oh, spreads yeah. even blow out. And look at all that supply just gobbled yeah. up. 
exactly that's what i mean is like so we we obviously this week with risk off saw supply saw spreads widen but given how much supply there was plus the risk off you would expect them to widen way more if people actually thought yeah. there was huge credit issues the bubble in credit which we're not seeing that now because the recessionary vibes is in sovereign in, in, yes. in sovereign credit and mm-hmm. we're in the cyclical downdraft so it's not being seen but fiscal dominance is still there and it will still be there but we probably won't see that again until after the Fed. Yeah, you're getting the cyclical you're getting the cyclical rotation in the long bonds because gross scare recession. But yeah, I feel like the big issue is going to come once that's complete because you know we we always talk about and you know I was kind of being coy about it this whole like who's going to buy the bonds and I know you retweeted that coin <laughs> but I mean part of that like on a secular basis I do believe that but we're in a cyclical phase right now where everybody is underexposed to long bonds um, going into what is looking exactly, like rather exactly. a recession or a go scare. So they're going to be buying and that's fine. But the real issues are going to come in two years, I think. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think the rule of thumb, if you go, go to slide 32, this is kind of interesting. Buy what the government is incentivizing. And, <laughs> yeah, but you know, we saw that. It's so true. This is, you know, 32. And I don't, I don't recommend buying this now. A lot of this is, is baked in on the chips act, but this is just a slide of how much money has been sloshed around in the market from some of these fiscal plans, you know, it was yeah. 200 billion in, you know, from the U S chips act that came in. And then, you know, the infrastructure plan, if you check out like XLI, that's been doing quite well too. We're, we're barely off all time highs. So yeah, this is the chips act. Um, mm-hmm. If you just bought semiconductors when this got announced, you'd just be rich and not have to care about yeah. any market right now. And, you know, and, you know and, who's and, nailed this really well is Russell Napier. Like in 2022, he was talking about you know financial repression and, and government expenditure, and just to get as close as you can to that government spending and just long the hell out of it. And yeah, that, he nailed it. But the trade is nearing its end. To your point, I think. It feels like it to me, like the, the the growth expectations and margins of NVIDIA are kind of coming down now. I just don't see how you can grow so fast so long. And not only that, but then you have these like weird market structure things. Like people are going to try and avoid passive concentration. I think this is this is going to be the next phase of the rotation. What's interesting is does that money come rotating into other sectors that have been so unloved? And do we see a massive outperformance from active management here on out? I, I like to think so. Like gold is really fascinating to me because it's barely off all time highs. There's like not too much passive money like concentrated in gold. And if you're an active fund in gold, you're probably crushing people right now. Yeah. When, the when, asset management industry like hates those type of assets because they're not like there's not a story to tell around it yeah even though it's like high performer yeah Yeah. there might be you know even with gold near all-time highs no one's talking about it which is kind of fascinating the positioning is long that one's i'm struggling with because i love that i love it secularly and and but positioning is so long in in it but it's not like this ai sentiment peak so there's definitely on a multi, like a year horizon, I think there's gas in the tank there, but I don't know. Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Polkadot. Out of the 500 protocols, one of them is called Origin Trail, and they're building a verifiable internet for AI, ensuring the provenance and verifiability of data to tackle challenges like bias and misinformation in AI systems. Used by global leaders like the British Standards Institution and the Swiss Federal Railways, Origin Trail is vital in sectors like asset tokenization, healthcare, and the metaverse. Powered by Polkadot, Origin Trail enhances the discoverability of crucial knowledge and secures information in the AI era. Power the verifiable internet with Origin Trail at origintrail.io. This episode is sponsored by Mantra. The Mantra chain built with the Cosmos SDK is the blockchain of choice for regulated digital assets offering compliance-ready modules and cross-chain interoperability. With partnerships like a $500 million tokenization project with the MAG Group, in collaboration with Zandbank and the United Arab Emirates, Mantra is at the forefront of the RWA revolution. Scalable with up to 10,000 transactions per second and secured by a sovereign proof of stake validator set, Mantra is designed for both permissionless and regulated applications, making it easier for institutions to enter Web3. Discover more about Mantra's capabilities and how you can participate at mantrachain.io. All right, 
back to the show. Can I go on a rant about AI for a sec? Yes. <laughs> you, yeah, you guys might enjoy this one, but I read this guy. His name is Ted Goya. He's a, he's a uh, jazz professor at Stanford that writes this incredible newsletter on culture, but he's also, he was a former investment banker, I think. So he's got a finance background too, but he writes how, you know, if you Google Beethoven with the generative AI, it shows up as like not an actual picture of Beethoven. It's like this evil looking generative AI picture that like is amalgamated by all the data that they think Beethoven actually looks like rather than the actual pictures of Beethoven that we know he actually looks like. So my my thought to the whole thing, what he said was centralized AI just can't work because it doesn't, it doesn't weigh um, the experts, like people who know the most about a subject will not get the benefit of a reality in a, in a centralized AI platform. You end up getting George Washington who ends up being black, you know, like, or what, whatever you get some crazy stuff because of like, giant narratives that uh, there's herd mentality in, in media and herds are always wrong. So like if you have the most amount of data, your, your generative AI is imputing all the worst parts of human nature. That's actually an interesting point because it's, you only make money when you're not consensus nine times yeah, out of 10. Totally. So like you're basically just, it's a giant consensus machine and which is a false reality in, in a lot of sense. Like, Experts are the ones in, in, in this Ted Goya's point is the humanities will actually, if you're a teacher of these subjects, you're going to, you're going to be so in demand because all the other stuff is just turning into complete nonsense. Yeah. And you have this true reality here because you studied it for years and you know, all the different pieces and your truth should be outweighed. So this is my point is the only way AI can actually work is if you have like science, like mathematical problems that are true, right? Or you have, but in culture, it doesn't work. Well, I'm always you know? right and you're wrong. So that it works because there is an answer there. My end point is decentralized AI would work because you'd have like, say Felix was an expert in freaking, you know, art history. And, but I have all these opinions of art history and I'm a moron. More people should back his truth than my truth, right? So that, that, that truth should weigh more rather than this. So my, my end point is like this whole generative AI CapEx cycle. I think it's just the first cycle of AI that is mm -hmm. busting now. Yeah. And we're, they'll probably have to figure out all those problems along the way, but it's like when you wrote, you know, you lay the railroads and on, and then you figure out you got the railroads, but they, they, you don't know how to use them. This is the first totally. cycle of, of um, Yeah, I always like to think about what like Drucker Miller says about his view of AI is that we overestimate it in the short term, but substantially underestimate it in the long term. And I think that's right. Yeah. But it, what's scary to me about AI is like it can turn into if you've centralized AI, you turn into propaganda really fast. You can control truths and realities, and maybe that's the plan. It's like the internet. It was first used to order books and now it's used to do everything. It's like yeah, it just takes time, but yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, censorship and propaganda, I've been looking into China this week and trying to figure out what's going on there. How do you guys like that segue? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think this really gets into why the markets are so confusing right now is because I think there's a few things happening. There's rate differentials causing things like yen carry trades to unwind, which is causing like a market structure deleveraging. There's the recession fears and growth fears and what's going on there. <clears throat> and then I think there's a, there's a global story of countries outside of the U.S. that are in recession or on the verge of it. And one of the big ones is, is China. Um, you know, over the past week, I've just been looking at what's been going on in commodities and, 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 you know, oil, which looks like it's about to finally break out of this range and head lower. You know, we're trading at about 68 right now. Um, and so, you know, been digging into China and what's going on there and just have a few slides I want to talk a bit about. So this is an, another chart from Eric here, just showing nominal GDP in China, um, compared to M1 growth eight, uh, six months forward. And you can see, you know, it's just M1's falling off a cliff and there's a pretty decent correlation, um, at least in terms of the trend, maybe not the significance, but of, uh, GDP heading lower from here. So. This is happening in the context of this is a bit more of some some real time data. Um, this is coming from uh, 
Andrew Stenos Larson and Steno research, but just looking at air pollution levels in Beijing, um, you know, we're back down to basically 2020 levels where there's was very little activity happening. Um, and then also, you know, Chinese credit growth has basically stagnated since the pandemic. Um, you know, there's just not a lot happening there right now in terms of new credit growth. And this is all getting to this point where there is this interesting um, Bloomberg article that came out last night from the former People's Bank of China governor saying that his nation should focus on fighting deflation in a rare admission by a prominent figure in China that falling prices are threatening the country's growth outlook. Um, so I, I think about all of that, what we're seeing coming from China, and then I look at the commodity weakness that we're seeing. So this is gasoline futures, which is about to take out pretty much any of the post-COVID lows, um, or sorry, inflationary cycle lows basically but going heading back towards where we were in the height of the covid recession um same with oil like i said we've been in this range um, and i've been kind of joking for a while over those last few months that anytime it goes up for a couple of days people start talking about rate hikes and anytime we go low for a couple of days people start talking about rate cuts and it's just hilarious it's just been making everybody seem wrong um but it feels like we're potentially seeing a trend emerge here um and then I look at that compared to the 30 or sorry, the 10 year treasury, the 30 year would also be quite tight here in terms of correlation, but the oil story is driving the U S treasury story. So yes, we're seeing some major growth scare fears happen in the U S that is leading to this flight to safety bond rotation that we talked about earlier in the show. But I think also paired with it is this other dynamic that's occurring from China and other global growth slowing down significantly leading to low, lower oil prices, which leads, you know, it's the key leading factor towards lower inflation, disinflation, which is leading to lower treasury yields. So I think that's, you know, something that we're starting to see accelerate in terms of a narrative. There's been talk people talking about how China's fucked for the last two years, but it's interesting to start to see it in actual market prices, I think is the difference to what we're seeing right now. Me, me and Tyler disagree on this often. I, I don't know. I'm not a China expert, so, and I don't follow it, like, giga closely so but when it tends to be the case that when it flare, flares up in western media that like it, it it's there's a big you know explosion happening it's usually towards bottoms because like it's always china's fault in the u.s if you live it's you know why is this why is inflation happening china can't, why is deflation canada blame canada yeah. always. <laughs> or, it's, or trump it's or trump so so it's just like one of those things that yeah, you want to stay balanced on i mean I, I look at, first of all, I think it's the other emerging nations like India that are more important to the next 10 years of growth. China is backward looking and everyone's kind yeah. of wrapped around the axle. Like it's, you know, China's had its moment. I think that it's like all these other Pakistan, India, et cetera, that will be more uh, larger contributors. But the commodity complex is your best signal, in my opinion, like the oil, oil price, et cetera. So but a lot of this is price narrative price. But again, like when you look at the Chinese bond market, you know, yields are in the gutter, but the currency's strong. So it's, it's strengthened recently when the fed, you know, when the fed cutting is coming to the picture. I feel like I that's because they're, they're not fully easing yet. China has been, exactly, you know, they've exactly. lowered a few short-term rate things, but they're they haven't not, done anything. Yeah, no, yeah. they, they've, they've respected, if they were, their currency would be looking like Japan's yeah. versus the yeah. dollar, but it's, totally. it hasn't over the last year, two years. So that's my point is like, yes, it's no doubt weak. Commodities are telling you that US employment, US inflation, you know, but we're now getting to a point where they can do something. That article, we just, there was another headline this this week. So it's that, it's that transition period we talked about. We're like, yeah, yes, it's weak, but- Major easing you know, is coming. <laughs> exactly. And, and people are questioning the efficacy and how much, which is a fair- thing to question but yeah. with inflation with oil plummeting that's a forward kind of forward indicator of inflation or real-time indicator of inflation is telling you there's a lot of room to, to yeah. ease and that's why i just think it's like it is not goldilocks if you're an overvalued tech company but you know if you're printing money hand over fist globally it's just that's a nice bitcoin environment that's why gold's doing what it's doing i i agree with that i got two interesting things which is one I think China 
it's not that China is imploding. China's real estate market is imploding. If you look at like China Construction Bank and Louis Gov talks about this, it's up like pretty substantially. Like it was, up, it was almost up like 20% this year. So that would go against the the China's completely imploding. I think it's they're deflating part of their market. Um, but there's parts of the market that they're they're actually trying to buoy the, the growth there. So but this is more interesting. You gotta hit hit me with slide 29. This is the FTSE index for the Asia Asia 40. So basically um Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand consisting of the top 40 constituents there by market cap, you would not think this is basically, I think what this is, is flight from China into all these other Asian um, economies, which are growing. So I don't know, it's probably a sign that, you know, they're really worried about something in the China real estate market unwinding. And you, you really wouldn't expect that to happen if you go, you know, to the next slide, slide 30 is, you see all the different um, Indonesia. That doesn't even include India in that in that thing. Yeah, but it, no. If if there's a huge implosion, though, wouldn't you expect risk assets, you know, in neighboring countries to also trade down, right? Not if you is have, more, you know, cl- capital flight through you know different different things. I, I don't know. It's it, it was more just interesting that you know in this weak dollar environment that mm-hmm. there's actually uh, countries that are doing quite well. Um, yeah, relative, you know, relatively speaking. Yeah, beneficiaries of well, I think it's also just lagged effects of like China be, being the the target of all Western governments for every problem they have and picking them to fight the battle with. And so, if you're a company looking to do business, like you can't have that uncertainty in a multi year horizon. People are worried about you know Taiwan invasion and all these things. Like you have to set up, start setting up contingencies so you're not setting down your business when a geopolitical flare-up happens. What's up, everybody? Just want to take a second out of the show to talk about the next major BlockWorks conference that's happening. Permissionless 3 is a leading crypto conference, and it's going to be happening in Salt Lake City this year from October 9th to 11th. There's going to be some major legendary speakers there from the likes of Balaji, Chris Dixon, and macro veterans like Dan Tafiaro will also be there. Not only that, but we're also going to be doing a live recording of the weekly roundup on the Margin Guys Emporium Edition, so you can come meet myself and Tyler and Quinn and even Mike will be there. If you're interested, we have a discount code, margin10. Use that and you'll get 10% off as well. So I hope to see you there and that we can catch up. All right, back to the show. I want to wrap up the show here with just following up on what the hell's going on in, in crypto because, you know, that continues to be the, the difficult thing to do because, you know, just the way crypto and Bitcoin trades is, you know, it's... It, it sort of feels like it just sort of slowly bleeds downwards until something happens and then we get this major movement in one direction or another. And to set the context of what I want to talk about, I just want to revisit this SOFR curve and just how damn steep it is. Because when you would look at this and you see this amount of easing coming so soon, you would be like, okay, I'm going to go buy Bitcoin. Like I'm going to buy the fastest horse, like Paul Tudor Jones says. But you know, you look at how it's actually trading today off the back of all this pretty weak jobs data. You know, we're we're hovering around 54,000 right now on, on Bitcoin. ETH's sub 2300. It's weak and it's been weak for many for a while now, even though we know the easing cycle is coming. And I think this really gets to this, this difficulty in, in navigating these moments um, and having different time horizons. So, you know, I know myself personally, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next month or so. For, for price. But I do know that as we go through this transition period, there's substantial easing coming and you want to own the fastest horse. Um, it's just about how do you get to that point and what's the path dependency of it. And that's what you need to manage for the next little bit here. And that's where it gets difficult. You know, there's, if it's going to happen, these sort of like major, you know, like March, 2020 flushes, not to that same degree, but those moments happen around this time maybe in the next three months or so, if it's going to happen. So you just have to prepare yourself however you want to do that, whether it's, you know, cash on the sidelines, shorting, I don't know. You, that's for you to decide, not me. But it's clear where we end up. It's just about how do you get there in one piece. Um, and I, I want to hear a bit, maybe starting with Quinn, just like how you navigate that, because, you know, you're you're running a crypto first fund. How do you manage that point of knowing where we're going to end up? It's just about how we actually get there. 
good point. I mean, everyone, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of leverage at times in crypto and some people are, you know, quite active traders, you know, other people take multi-month, some people take multi-year if you're VC. Um, I think about this current situation is like you said, that, that like darkest before the dawn where right before you get the efficacy of the rate hike cuts. The other point I would actually maybe break down is when we talk about like rate cut, the effects of rate cuts and are rate cuts priced in is a good question. Um, there's kind of two components. So there's the market financial market, financial asset market component of we, the market expecting rate cuts and the two year and 10 year and bond yields, which are bellwether benchmarks for all assets trade low, with lower yields. And that's a naturally stimulative effect to other assets because it lowers the cost, the benchmark cost of capital and you know, that all else equal people then want to replace those exposures with higher potential returning assets. And that's why you saw CQE infinity usually causing asset price inflation and not uh, goods and services inflation. That's kind of only one component. The other component is their effects on the real economy, which take time. So I think there's a fair amount, there's a, there's a fair amount of correctness in the argument that that rate cuts clearly, I mean, you look at the silver curve, are priced into uh, into the asset markets and the financial markets. But what's not yet known is how those will work them, their way through the real economy. My take is that, that that effect will actually be stronger than previous rate cuts because uh, given where fiscal deficit spending is at and the built, built-in underlying strength, economic strength caused by that. And, and GDP is a nominal number. Um, so, you know, when the government's spending 6% fiscal deficits of GDP, that can look like 4% inflation and 2% growth, or it can look like 5% growth and 1% inflation or whatever, but it's a combo of the two. And I think over time, inflation is going to pick back up when they do start cutting. I think they're going to solve it. And we've seen the governors today kind of opening the door to potentially 50, but yeah, the, you need weakness to get the response. You need the, the the stock market to crumble to some degree and people to get fear and, and make a response. And so that's, you always see those spike downs and I don't, I don't really operate with too much like leverage often. Um, very, very rare. So like I'm usually thinking the world, like I don't think downside for Bitcoin is much below 50. I kind of think of that as a floor and I think upside, if there's policy response is like a hundred. So for me, if I if I get long at fifty five and I have a stop at fifty, that's ten percent risk. Um, but I think the upside is a two x. That's a fantastic risk reward. But that's a multi month, potentially a year view. Like, do I care what happens today? I don't like to see Bitcoin go down, but like, I'm not three x leverage where Bitcoin goes down five percent. I lose every, you know, like. You just have your position appropriately. And I also have expressed uh, the, the difference in owning Bitcoin versus many other crypto assets, which I do think have a much more difficult story in, in these economic reignitions, usually see Bitcoin lead out of them. So if you're just sitting in alts that are bleeding, it's probably painful. But if you're down 5% on a stop of Bitcoin because you think you can 2x, it's like you have your parameters and you have your signals for the trade. When you put on, you have your entries your targets and and then what causes you to either confirm your view or, or invalidate your view and you're wrong often but you, you have those signals you put in place that says if this happens i'm probably wrong outside of just bitcoin's price but other things in the market i'm going to cut the position and reevaluate or if this happens i'm probably right and i'm going to add to the position but yeah it's like you have to always match your you know your your volatility with your time horizon. If I have a three to six month trade view and it's it's in crypto, you got to expect, you know, decent amount of vol to have to stomach in that time period. It's not going to go straight up from when you when you put the position on. So, those are just th- things to think about like matching how you're thinking about the trade and the duration and your your acceptable risk like through the through the life of that. I, I- I think with Bitcoin, if you're here just for day trading, this is, this is why it shakes out all the retail traders 
And volatility is actually the best part of Bitcoin because if you can't stomach the vol, you don't own, you don't get to have the the upside. So, you know, th- that's that's part of it. That being said, I'm I'm with I'm with Quinn on the you never like to to take drawdowns against it, but it it makes too much sense in this world right now. It was created for this purpose to see all the geopolitical angst, et cetera. And the adoption cycle is is getting stronger in a lot of senses. You know, the, you could have said the past month or two, Bitcoin was being held down by um, some forces like German selling, Mt. Gox, you know, the, the whole litany of things. But it could also have just been correlated with the the drawdown in risk and actually front run uh, a lot of this this stuff in in large cap tech and maybe that's what it was sniffing out and that's what I don't like about Bitcoin here. What I think is happening larger and a, a larger thing is this concentration, this battle of centralization versus decentralization is really gonna. It's the next forty years of investment, which is we want. We want to get out of large cap tech. Large, large cap tech had the rain. I think we saw the blow off top in it. We've talked about that ad nauseum here. And we need Bitcoin to detach from that. And we need that capital to rotate um, into Bitcoin. Similarly to like what we're seeing in consumer staples or gold. Like that's what I was hoping would happen. It hasn't happened yet, but... I think people eventually will realize that store of value, it will be the the millennial Gen Z store of value. And I, I think if you have American dynamism, Bitcoin will have, uh, what I mean by American dynamism is if we don't go into some weird communist type centralized dystopia world in the next, you know, five, 10 years, <laughs> I think Bitcoin eventually detaches from the the correlation and large cap tech and semis, which that point, Tyler, is is massive. I think in these periods where the macro environment is shifting, that's just what people need to remember is that Bitcoin's correlations to different asset classes actually changes. It's it's sometimes more uh, over a 10 year period. You can think of it like gold with NASDAQ, but over two to you know one to six month periods it changes like q4 2020 uh parts of 2023 to the second half of 2023 nvidia nvidia ai didn't go anywhere it was just flat bitcoin had its mm-hmm. best you know period q4 2020 same thing uh large cap tech didn't really do much so in those situations it was more correlated to the small caps and the reignition of the real economy and monetary policy easing despite things not being that bad that's where i think we're headed and I think there's chop here where you have people that trade assets based on fundamentals. You have people that trade on algorithms. You have people that trade on on correlations to other assets. And so in these periods where one, the macro regime is shifting and people are trying to figure out what to own, that adds volatility. But then when Bitcoin's correlations to those, you know, the mumbo jumbo of, of shifting assets also is changing, that creates additional volatility in in and how people should be thinking about the asset class. It requires forward-looking uh, non-consensus views to say, well, it's correlated to this today, and I think it's going to be correlated to something different tomorrow. But you know, that's where there's alpha if you can piece that together. And I, I think it is going to become uncorrelated from large cap tech uh, for, for the next three to six months. In the same way, I think gold might take a breather because if, if the uh, central bank responses do work globally, then you see... OPEX and, and cyclical commodities like oil and copper reignite and take the lead in baton from gold in the same way that Bitcoin takes the baton from NVIDIA and AI. So you have to kind of understand, are we in a trend? Are we starting a new trend? Or are we kind of in a shakeout regime where, where it's murky? Yeah, well said. And I think just to wrap that up, it feels like, you know, we all know Bitcoin's going to be a lot higher in 10 to 12 months. It's just that the path, the distribution of probable outcomes to get there are quite wide. So that's where I'm focused on. And that's why I don't have a lot of conviction right now in the certainty of that outcome. I'm just trying to make it the least painful throughout all of those outcomes to get to that point. But it's I feel very strong about where we're going. It's just about how we get there. And, you know, whether that's emotional or, or your, your risk management levels of how you deal with that, it's, you know, a lot of things could happen right now. I think that the distribution is wide. So, you know, just 
try to keep the resolve as we get to that point. Really, just to, just to add, we look at the dollar is crumbled here. We're we're now in a rate easing cycle. Let's step back for a second and realize that, you know, if you told me the dollar is where it is now with the ten year yield at three point seven. You would have been like, oh, Bitcoin's at 100K already. But <laughs> yeah. You, you, I think a lot of the selling potentially could be over leveraged retail traders, along with some of these other events that have gone on. And, mm-hmm. you know, clearly we know the low end consumer is, is under some pain. So maybe it takes a little while to, to detach from that. So yeah. That's, all right. yeah. That, that's the exact reason why Bitcoin dominance leads out of this, uh, Tyler, uh, is is that reason actually mm-hmm. like alt season will not commence tomorrow but bitcoin might bottom tomorrow type of thing it, you, totally. you have to get you have to it's momentum asset class those are the those are the second and third trades not the first trade in a new trend cool guys well i think we got to wrap it there but um yeah for everybody that's uh looking at markets right now just keep your resolve and your principles and the easing cycle touch grass. it's just about how we got there touch grass can i get one of those shirts uh quinn has what is that like uh Damn, that's some yeah, European you know, bougie-ness. Not everybody, can look this, not everybody can look this good, Tyler. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right, guys. Right, Have a good week. stuff. See ya. There's over 500 protocols building on Polkadot, and one of them is called Polymech. Polymech is a decentralized, community-driven funding protocol on Polkadot, enabling regulatory compliant and transparent fundraising of Web3. Polymech ensures compliance with a novel KYC AML process, facilitating a trustless and automated funding process from fundraising to token distribution. By removing intermediaries, Polymech offers accessible, inclusive, and transparent funding opportunities for all participants. Powered by Polkadot, Polymech is redefining fundraising in the crypto space. Explore how to become a Polkadot VC at polymech.org.